Professional Development Series. Our topic for today is Cooperative Learning Models Moving Towards Success. We're going to be exploring strategies for teaching our students to work together, to think critically and creatively, and to achieve positive interdependence. Cooperative learning really works, and it can benefit all students. Research shows us that this instructional strategy promotes achievement, develop social skills, and help students take responsibility for their own learning. Students who are given the opportunity to work on a task as part of a team learn to investigate, discuss, report, debate, and inquire. The January 1990 issue of Educational Leadership Magazine is devoted to the topic of cooperative learning. Robert Slavin, Nancy Madden, and Robert Stevens comments that cooperative learning is not only an innovation in itself, but also a catalyst for other needed changes in curriculum and instruction. As we visit restructured schools, we see cooperative learning as an integral part of preparing students for the future. As the teacher's role changes from lecturer to facilitator, we see the role of the student becoming more and more active especially in using technology and other resources to accomplish a task. While cooperative learning methods vary, one thing is clear. The power of cooperative learning is unlimited. When we work together to get a job done, we learn not only from our own point of view, but from the perspectives of our teammates as well. We begin to see that how a problem is solved is just as important as getting the right answer. Today, we welcome Judy Olson, National Consultant, to give us an exploration journey on cooperative learning strategies. Welcome, Judy. Thank you, Paula. There are many of you and many other sites out there watching us this afternoon as we are exploring the topic of cooperative learning models. It is an exciting thing to look at, and what we'd like to do is share with you some real practical information that you can use to hit the ground running tomorrow when you get into your classroom. We want to be able to make it very transportable and very transferable as we share with you what this model is and what it can do for you with your, classroom, with your students in your classroom. It's important that we start out by looking first at the rationale of why all this hoopla about cooperative learning. Why would, as Paula said, ASCD devote an entire journal, an entire ed leadership issue to the topic? We'd invite you at this point, if you would please, to turn to page three of your study guide and to jot down a few notes in terms of rationale. One of the reasons that it is such an important model for us to look at right now is that one, as Paula said, it does work. It really does work. There is um, a growing, growing body of research that shows that when students work in cooperative learning some of the time, now we're not talking about exclusively doing cooperative learning in your classroom, but when it is one of the strategies that you use in the classroom, that achievement scores go up. Students learn better. They remember longer. Retention is improved. There's also just a, a very nice um, social, emotional sort of benefit of just the classroom climate improving. The kind of social, emotional ambience of the classroom seems to change when you have students working in cooperative groups. But beyond the research-supported um, you know, rationale information, there's also some very important information when we look at our current cultural milieu, our current paradigm. We have moved, say the futurists and the sociologists, into the service age. 
Up until the 90s, we were firmly in the information age, but we've changed. And the thing that, that constitutes that paradigm shift is what is the major economic product of the country? And right now, that product is service. Those businesses, those organizations who take the graduates from our schools say to us that they want students who can do two things. Students who can think and think creatively and problem, uh, th creatively and critically to solve problems and they want students who can do that while working together with other people. That's really important information for us when we look at the current cultural paradigm. People in personnel tell us that 8 out of 10 job terminations, so 8 out of 10 people who get fired, the reason for that job termination has something to do with the fact that those people cannot get along with other people on the job site. They are not team players. When you look at major corporations out there, most of the corporations are moving toward team-based type of organizational structures. We need to know how to function as a good, viable member of the team. The rationale for cooperative learning. Cooperative learning is not a simple model. It's a complex model. You don't learn, if this is your first um, experience with cooperative learning, you will not be an expert at the end of the telecast. If you've been working for cooperative learning in your classroom for a whole year, you already know that at the end of tonight you won't be an expert. But you hope maybe you'll pick up one or two tricks. It is said that it takes anywhere from three to five years to really get to that kind of automaticity or executive control level in using the model of cooperative learning. So one of the real important things for me as a classroom teacher or as an administrator who's trying to support classroom teachers using this model in the classroom is that we know it takes some time to grow the expertise so that we don't expect immediate perfection right off the bat. Our purpose tonight is to give you some ideas for adding to that expertise. And we've structured it around some very specific objectives. We'd like to share those objectives with you now, and you'll find them in your study guide on the bottom of page three. What we would hope is that at the end of the evening's telecast, that these following things will have occurred for you. That you will understand, that you will have explored and understand the four major principles of cooperative learning. You will know what they are and how they work. You will understand the fact that they are a principle because if these major structures aren't there, then you don't have cooperative learning. That's one objective. But a principles without practice really make no sense. So we also want to be able to share with you some very specific ideas for applying each of the principles. We want to give you three techniques for applying each one of the principles that you um, We'll, we'll learn about as we proceed through. In addition to the principles and the three techniques, we would also hope that you would gain some benefit from an organizing metaphor. We're going to be presenting the entire telecast based around a metaphor that compares cooperative learning with a bicycle. Of course, we have to walk our talk. So another objective is that you will network at your viewing site. You'll have a chance to work with each other to do some both informal and formal cooperative lessons there at the viewing site and to uh, learn from each other as well as to learn from me and from Paula here on the, the set. Now the problem with that is that some of you may be watching as a singleton, as an individual lone viewer out there. If that's the case, what we'll need you to do is just sort of project what it would be like if you were in a group. Also, some of you, when we ask you to form in groups in pairs and there are only, you know, there are three of you, one person can be an observer. We'll try to give you some adjusting sort of directions with each of them, but networking and working in groups will be part of tonight's experience. And then finally, probably the most important objective on the whole list is to have fun. When we laugh and we smile, while we're learning, we learn better and we remember longer. 
So those are the objectives and you have them listed there on page three. We will take a <coughs> revisit those at the end of the telecast and make sure that we have accomplished what it is that we have set out to do. With the objectives behind us, it's time for us to take a look at the uh, notion of cooperative learning as being like a bicycle. Cooperative learning is a, uh, it can be done metaphorically with a bicycle and can be compared to major parts on the bicycle. Now, as we're going to pull a bicycle up here on the set. Now, our bicycle has many, many complex parts to it. And we're going to ask you to think about the complexity of the bicycle and how it might be like the model of cooperative learning. So what I'm going to ask you to do at this point is to just turn to a neighbor there in the viewing site and just discuss for a minute, how is cooperative learning like a bicycle? Okay, would you do that just one minute? Well, you had a chance to dialogue and talk about it. Let's see what Paula was thinking about. Paula, when you um, think about how a bicycle is like cooperative learning or vice versa, what do you come up with? Well, I think about the fact that to have success uh, in riding a bicycle, that everything has to work together. All the parts have to interact. Mm -hmm. And I also thought about the fact that learning to ride a bicycle, being able to ride, takes you out so that you can explore new horizons, so that you can go oh, to new nice. places. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a, a real happy sort of picture for me when, when I think about it. Another thing that I often think about is that it takes a long time for many of us to learn to ride a bicycle. But then once you ride it, you know, once you learn, it seems like you don't forget. So it's even you, though it's right. complex, it, it stays there. Now, as you thought about um, how a bicycle was like a uh, cooperative learning or cooperative learning like a bicycle at your viewing sites, you probably came up with those ideas and many, many more. What I'd like to do is to broaden that metaphor just a little bit and to explain some very specific things to you about how the bicycle will be a real uh, advanced organizer, a mental framework for us to use as we gain some skills in this complex model of cooperative learning. You see, I would suggest to you that the bicycle has four major parts its pedals, its gears, and its kickstand. Now we're going to label each of these parts as one of the major principles of cooperative learning. If I were going to go out outside the studio here now and take this jazzy bike and go ahead and start to ride it, the first thing I'd need to do is to take this up pedal, this one that is sticking up the highest, put my foot on it after having place myself so I was balanced on the machine, and then push on that pedal. That's how it is with cooperative learning in the classroom. I have to take that first pedal, that first principle of cooperative learning. I have to put my foot on it and I have to push. I have got to start out the notion of working in groups for my students, whether they're kindergarten kids or kids in calculus in high school. I've got to convince them that this is a positively interdependent activity. In other words, they have to work together to be successful. Now, if you work with primary students, you're going to find it's fairly easy for you to convince the students of this. If you work with intermediate or secondary students, you're going to find it's progressively more difficult because these students have been taught that when they do play, you know, turn and talk to their neighbor, when they do look at their neighbor's paper, that then they're likely to get in trouble. They've been very conditioned toward the more individual and competitive forms of instruction. So it takes a while to really get this positive interdependent pedal really as a viable part of the machine. But it's essential if I'm going to get off to a good start. But as soon as I push down, as soon as I put some pressure on positive interdependence, right away, right away, this next up pedal is going to be there. And that's the second principle. 
It's the principle of individual accountability. This pedal says, I've got to do everything I can to have my group be successful, but more importantly, or as important, I also, when it's all done, I have to be able to take the learning away with me. I need to know all that our group was learning about. I don't need to know just my portion, or I don't need to just sit here and sign off passively on whatever it was our group did. I need to be individually accountable for each and everything that our group as a whole did. So I take it away in my head or my experience base and can do what it is that we did in the group. Now, I get both of those pedals going along pretty well. We, positive interdependence. Me, individual accountability. And see, as teacher, I've got to keep pressure on both of those pedals. I've got to keep them both going for this bike to really be able to traverse. But the bike is only going to be able to tra traverse solid, flat ground at that level. I mean, I'm not going to be able to do anything extra special. I'm not going to be able to go up hills or down hills. To do that, I need a more complex machine. To do that, I have to get up here to these fancy little levers, and I have to be able to shift gears. I have to be able to switch and have different things happening as the groups are proceeding through their activities. I would suggest to you that there are probably three gears that the bicycle is going to need to use in order to really be able to do a good job of traversing in this kind of learning model. One set of gears for grouping, that's gear one. One set of gears for getting started, that's gear two. And one set of gears called gearing up, gearing down, or group process, that's gear three. And we're going to be developing each one of these in detail and skill building with, with each of these. But the metaphor can be a wonderful, again, way of organizing all of this information for us. We've got the we pedal and we've got the me pedal, and we can shift gears so we can do much more complicated terrain, much more complicated learning. But now when the ride is over, I don't just drop my really great bicycle on the ground and then walk away. I kick down the kickstand. I kick it down and then stop and talk with the fellow travelers about the ride. I debrief the lesson. If there are two of us, the two of us talk about what we did, what we learned and how well we learned it. If there are three of us, the three of us did. If there are four of us, the four of us do it. But we need to stop and talk about how the lesson went. That's where closure happens. That's where we tie the learning up and we, def we close the circle. We get a bow on the package. We're able to finish it up into a nice, good, tight package. Okay. In summary, there are four major parts for the bicycle. And we can give those four major parts each a specific label. There is positive interdependence, one pedal, the we pedal. There is individual accountability, the me pedal. There is the set of gears for all of the group skills that need to be used when running the bicycle. And then finally, when the trip is all over, there is kicking down the kickstand, debriefing, talking about the trip, and how it went. Okay, That is the organizing metaphor. What we want to do now is get expert at each of those pedals, gain some expertise with using the gears, and gain some expertise with debriefing. So let's take the we pedal first. Let's take positive interdependence. In order to look at this pedal and to really be able to get a sense about it, we'd invite you to look at page four of your study guide. And we're going to structure just some experiences for you for a minute, have you do some things, and uh, play around with the meaning of the word at a tactile kinesthetic level first. And then we'll let you process the information, and we're going to pull it down then to a good definitive definition and some application. So the first thing I need to ask you to do there in your viewing sites is to pair up. Here's one of those you know, specific networking times. We're going to ask you to get into partners, 
decide who is A and who is B in each partnership. Okay? Now again, if you've got three people, you know, if it works out that you have one trio or you have three people at the viewing site, one person can be the observer for this particular activity. If you're watching alone, I'd like you to vicariously think of what this would be like and then also think about maybe using something like this um, for your students to help them understand what is positive in interdependence, okay? All right, if we could get all pairs, A's and B's, to stand up facing each other, okay? Paul and I are going to uh, do this right here in, in TV land with you as, as well, okay? Paula is A, I'm B. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my hands on Paula's shoulders, all right? I'm B. So all B's in the viewing audience, put your hands on the shoulders of your partner A, okay? Okay. Now, A's, please take two steps backward. Okay, that leaves you, B, in a rather uncomfortable, sort of stretched out, very vulnerable position. This is called dependence, because Paula's definitely one up on me, because if she moves, I'm going to fall flat on my nose, or have to do some very quick kind of recovery kinds of, kinds of things. So Paula, would you take two steps in before I do fall over? <laughs> okay, that's dependence. That's not interdependence. Now, me standing here, Paula standing there, not interacting at all, that's independence. She's totally independent of me, I'm totally independent of her. That, that's different altogether. But what we're working for is interdependence. So again, if A's and B's could follow directions, B's put your hands again on the shoulder of A, but A, you also put your hands on the shoulders of B. This time there's that kind of connection together, and now you both take one step back. Okay? This this fulcrum kind of force that you have keeps you, even though it's a little stretch, and cooperative learning can be a stretch, you support one another. There's a sense of stability and balance here that Paula and I can even rock back and forth a little bit and not fall over. But if I'd have tried to rock before when I was dependent, I'd have been on my nose. Okay, let's take our step back in. Thank you, Paula. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, if you could just sit back down for a minute and let's take a look at those words again. Independent, she and I don't even know the other one is there. Dependent, I am very needy of everything she can give me, but I'm not giving anything back. I mean, I really need her, but she doesn't need me. Interdependent, there is a mutuality in it. There is a sense of the two of us needing each other for stability, security, and support. Those are really important words for us to understand up here as well as to understand conceptually so we really own the terms. The reason that's so important is that when we understand the difference between dependence and interdependence, we can more adequately, accurately, and emphatically describe these terms and teach these terms to our students. Let's take a look at those two terms again of dependent and interdependent. Dependent means I am in a one down position or you are. So if you were B, like I was, you were in a one down position to A. They had a whole lot of control over your stability. But interdependent, that's a different, different approach. You and I are equal. We, are, we have a real sense of mutuality and balance of power. Now you may wonder why I'm making such a big deal about a definition of, of one term. Because it is the starting place for cooperative learning. If I don't get students understanding about being positively interdependent, we needing each other so we can productively, positively do the task assigned, then I'm not going to be able to get my groups working well. It is that very alpha place of the whole model. It's that very beginning spot. Back to the metaphor of the bicycle, if I don't push off on that first pedal, 
then I'm never going to get the bicycle in motion. And it's the first thing I really need to do. And I need to make my students very, very aware of that term. Now again, I'd invite you, if you would, please to look at your study guide. It says on your study guide there on, um, on page 4 that we would like you to write a definition. You'll notice there's a dotted line there. Above the, the dotted line, I'd like you to write what, how would you define positive interdependence? If you were going to teach it to your students, what would you do operationally? What would you say? Now, if you teach kindergarten, it's going to sound a little different than if you teach fourth. That's going to sound a little different than if you teach eighth. And that might still sound a little different than if you teach biology at the high school. So thinking of your students, how would you write the term for positive interdependence? Okay, would you take a minute now, please, at the viewing sites and write your definition there on the study guide? Now, Paula, you work with adults, and you work in the area of training. So as you write your definition of positive interdependence, what does it sound like? Well, I often think about interdependence as an interdependence of nations, like perhaps the United Nations, hmm. where the nations depend on each other for some support, but they must still operate independently at times as well. Yeah, that I the interdependence itself almost has the seed of the next part in it, doesn't it? Right, absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh -huh. What I would like to um, suggest to you is that you need to make the definition be yours. It needs to be right for you and right for your students, just as Paula was right now working with it to make it right for her in her position in working with the adult learner. But I would want to suggest to you that there are some pieces in our definition that we should have. So if we could, I'd like us to look at a, a definition that I have synthesized. I've put it together from the kind of cooperative learning gurus that are working right now in, in, our, you know, in our profession. So I'd like you to look at this definition and then record it in, again, in your study guide and record it under the dotted line. Let's take a look at positive interdependence as synthesized from the experts. It is the relationship in which individuals and or groups are vested in each other's success. So see, as that implies, I not only am going to work to have a group of three students or four students be positively interdependent. I'm even going to work to get group to group kind of interdependence to happen and to occur. Okay, positive interdependence. When you look at this term, the term, the, it, it's a description of the principle, but as I said to you before, a principle without practice is just going to sit there. It, it would be like looking at the pedal and naming the pedal positive interdependence, but not really doing anything to, to push. So I want to share with you a couple of techniques right now for teaching positive interdependence to the students. And the first one that I would suggest would be that um, you would watch very carefully how you phrase your objectives that you give to a cooperative group. If I'm teaching a math lesson, let's say I'm teaching algebra. Lucky for the country I'm not, but let's say that I would be that I would be teaching algebra. And I'm working on teaching students how to solve for an unknown. And we have this series of practice problems. Well, if I am working with students as individuals, I will say you will correctly solve five uh, these five problems or five of the eight problems or however I would work r word the objective but it would say you will or the student will or each student will but the wording would emphasize the individuality of the activity and there are times that that's real appropriate but if I want students working in a group to practice these math problems then I am going to have to state it in such a way that it emphasizes the interdependence of the activity. 
I would need to say something like everyone in the group will know how to successfully complete all five problems. You see, it's a small difference, but it's a major difference. I don't say each student or each person or you will. Instead, I say everyone in the group will know. Those, those key beginning words of the objective are absolutely um, unbelievably powerful. The mindset that that gives to the students. Later I'm going to be talking to you about the importance of keeping your objectives posted when groups are working. You know, we all, all know and we've learned lots of other models about the importance of teaching to an objective. That's not new stuff. But with cooperative learning, it's so important that that objective is seen and it's up there. So as because it's seen and it's up there, I need to be very careful about how I write it. So I need to say things like everyone in the group will, all students in the group will, all group members will, um, each individual working together in the group will. I mean, and there are lots of ways that I can state it. And after a while, you can even get it down to a nice little uh, tight shorthand of um, AMW, all members will. And after the students get acclimated to that, they see that. And then it's, it even makes your posting of the objectives that much more um, you know, time efficient. But when you start out, you want to, and it seems like a nuisance, and it seems like hey, that can't be that big a deal. But trust me, that one is a big one. That's one technique. Another technique I'd like to suggest to you is if I'm going to help, if I'm going to have students use cooperative learning well in my classroom, I have to teach the model to them. See, in essence, you become a teacher trainer and you teach them how to be teachers of self and each other in, in groups. And if I'm going to do that, I need to teach them about positive interdependence. So I need to teach the definition to them. Or I need to pull a definition from them and help them to, you know, define it in their own kid language fourth grade ease or ninth grade ease or whatever that might that might be. So that would be another technique is having the students define the term themselves. You might even think of using the bicycle metaphor. You know, if it works for you and makes sense about we and me, group skills, and debriefing, if that makes sense for you, you might want to think about using that to introduce and teach the metaphor, um, you know, teaching the model to, to the students. Judy, what if I, I've done this and yet it still doesn't work? What, what then would I do? Um, I think probably one of the hardest things with cooperative learning, Paul, is being patient. Mm -hmm. um, and when you say when it doesn't work, I'm thinking of like secondary groups that I've worked with, the, the kids, because they are so much more conditioned to the fact that if you and I are working together, it must be party time because that's the only time that I've been allowed to talk to other kids all that much in the classroom is during free time or break time or something like that. And so they, because they wrongly associate what this means, they inappropriately use their, their time and they don't get really vested in each other's learning. They get just vested in some individual fun, fun sort of time. So I guess a roundabout way of giving, I'm doing it roundabout, let me be more direct, be patient, be persistent. Hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. Keep defining, um, keep w working on those, those objectives, and remembering the wisdom of um, the author of LeBouf, L-E-B-O-E-U-F. He wrote a book on the greatest management principle in the world. What gets done is what gets rewarded. When I find groups working together well, I need to appropriately reward it, appropriate being grade level kinds of things. So okay. define and refine and keep rewarding. There you go. <laughs> that nice, tight summary. Very, very, okay. very good. That is the we pedal. Okay? I've pushed off. The kids have got it defined. I'm using these good objectives. But immediately, and I don't wait for a week, it's like immediately after getting the students launched interdependently, I've got to keep emphasizing individual accountability. Might you. Now just think about students that you know and love in your classrooms. Might this ever happen? That I'm working with Paula. I know Paula's a really bright, smart student in my class. So I just sit back and relax. I just sit back and hitchhike and let Paula do all the work. Might that happen? 
not in your class, right? Not with the kids that you know and love. That, you know, we are human beings, and human beings will tend, do tend to take the path of re least resistance. And what we need to do is help students very clearly understand that in every group activity, they have a very strong individual obligation. And that individual obligation involves two things. Would you again look at your study guide, please? And if you would look at page five, if we're talking about the me pedal, the individual accountability pedal. What we're talking about there is convincing students they have to know the stuff and they have to take it away from the group with them. Would you pre-think a definition? How would you write it? What, how would it make sense to you? And then I'll come back and give you, again, some more definitive information and ask you to take some, in, some additional notes. But that emphasis of the individual's accountability in the group activity, different than the we, related but different. Would you take a minute and write that definition, please? Okay, you had just a few moments there, about one minute, to pre-write, pre-think and write your definition of individual accountability. What I'd like to do at this point is again share with you the definition that I've synthesized from the experts. See, I'm not a researcher and I don't develop my own models, but I'm a good pragmatist and a synthesis, and so I tend to pull together the things that work. And so I'd like to share that definition with you about individual accountability. For me, individual accountability is the understanding that as a group member, I have to do two things. And again, I'd invite you to jot this down there on your study guide. I have to do these two things. I have to make the very best and most significant contribution to the group I can. So I've got to give as much as I possibly can give. But I've also got to be able to take away, to be able to reproduce the learning when I leave the group. I've got to be able to do what we did in the group when I'm all on my own. So you see, individual accountability really becomes the transfer objective for us instructionally. So I need to really convince the students that this is going to um, be a this is going to be a reality. They are going to be checked. Individual accountability. A principle. What about the practice? I'm going to suggest one practice that works very, very well. You can jot this down there in your study guide. Is that of spot checking? By spot checking, I am going to visit groups. I'm going to walk around the room. So one of the things in cooperative learning is you as teacher are extremely mobile. You're working, walking around going, you know, in lots and lots and lots of different places in the classroom. And you visit each group. And you try, you know, remembering the wisdom of TESA, Teacher Expectation Student Achievement, that says call on all kids individually, equitably. Well, now we want to call on all groups equitably. I don't always want to go to group three and five, but I want to make sure I get one and seven. So getting all groups. But I'm going to visit the groups. And then I am going to just say, excuse me, and I'm going to interrupt. And I'm going to spot check by just giving a quick oral quiz. I'm going to ask some real quick questions and say, OK, uh, what's the answer to seven? Can you give me this problem? Can you show me how you work that one? And I'll go through and, and just kind of take a, a uh, uh, checking for understanding reading of the groups, uh, the individuals in, in the classroom. That's one way I can do spot check. Another way I can do spot check is I can have a pre-agreed upon, a group agreement sort of um, arrangement with my students for interrupting all group activity. And that can be anything. It can be a wiggle of the lights. It can be a clap of the hands. It can be eyes front. It can be uh, attention, please. You know, whatever works with you with your students. And it's going to be different from different grade levels. One teacher had a really charming little set of chimes and just played a certain chime, a do, 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 do. And boy, students just immediately came up out of groups and, and looked at her. And then did a whole group spot check. Time for a spot check. I need to check for understanding and then just called it st on in students at random, again, trying to sample somebody from each group to see what was happening and if students really did understand. 
Really, what I want to tell you is that you already have all the techniques you need for enforcing this principle, because you use the same techniques that you use in checking for understanding when you are doing direct instruction. Exact same things. You just are going to have to break into groups in order to be able to do it. Okay? So Judy, the spot check questions can be used effectively at all age levels and all grade levels. Absolutely. And you know where um, the, the nice thing uh, for teachers in using the spot check is they can prevent a lot of wasted time because if I haven't set the groups up right or um, something isn't functioning quite right, that, you know, where I instructionally didn't do something organizationally in the beginning to set the groups up for success, I can prevent a lot of wasted time when I check, you know, if I call on six students and they still can't solve these problems and they were supposed to do practice in their groups, well then that shows me this was, this was not the right kind of time. It, mm -hmm. it would have been a, uh, a b better, this one would have been a better lesson to do maybe by whole group still. They, they needed some more direct teaching from me before I did that. So it really helps me to sort of stick my finger in, take it out, see how high the skill level is and if the students are going to benefit from keeping going or I should stop and do something, do something different. The other thing that it helps students do is it reinforces the notion of um, clarification, the importance of clarification, just kind of stopping and questioning every once in a while. Because eventually it's what I want the students to be doing internally mm -hmm, right. is doing their own spot checking. So it kind of forces that issue a little bit. Okay? Yeah. So we have two pedals on our bicycle already looked at. We have the Wii pedal of positive interdependence. We have the me pedal of individual accountability. With both of them, I've asked you to think a definition that's right for you with your students. I've shared with you kind of the conceptual, critical attribute, synthesis sort of definition that I use in teaching the model to teachers. And um, then we've talked about some techniques by which we might get both of those pedals being pushed on in our classrooms. So what we need to do now is to take a look, <coughs> pardon me, take a look at how much, those, how much sense those are making to you. What I'd like to ask you to do is again to partner up. Now if you have the option, because you have enough people at your viewing site, I'd like you to partner with somebody different from before. So different than your A, B, you know, thing where you did the exercise on dependent and interdependent. Now I'd like you to, um, uh, you know, partner up with somebody else. Just switch around chairs or whatever you need to do as quickly as you can. Partner up with somebody, preferably if there's somebody in the viewing audience there that you haven't talked to very much yet, if you would uh, partner up with that person at this point. And then again, very quickly decide who is A and who is B. Okay, can I get you to do that? If there is a third person, that person again can be observer. If you're doing this all on your own, it'll have to be an internal dialogue sort of thing. And what I'd like is I'd like person A, I would like you to paraphrase for B, what about the Wii pedal? What is it? How do you use it? And then person B, would you paraphrase the me pedal. What is it? How do you use it? Okay, so you are going to take and um, work at that comprehension level. You're going to put together the stuff we've talked about and then share it with your partner. Okay, I'd like you to spend two minutes doing that, please. You know, Judy, that is a very powerful strategy, and that getting to share with a partner, as I've just done with you, is a wonderful way for me to internalize the kinds of things we've been talking about. You know, that is such, that, that probably is one of the key um, qualities of cooperative learning, is that it allows students the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. Because like some of our learning styles, wisdom has taught us that some students are external processors, and I think you and I both are. 
And so if we can talk it, we can think it better. Internal processors think it and then can talk it later just, just fine, but the talking actually helps us to, to clarify. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we used just an informal cooperative technique. It wasn't the full-blown cooperative model, but it was one technique that is used within the model as, as a whole. So that's the other thing that's really nice for teachers to know is that, yes, there's the full-blown model with all four principles, but there are also all of these little small just cooperative techniques that can be blended right in mm -hmm. with their direct instruction as well. So some important pieces of wisdom there. Right. Well, that concludes what we are going to do within this telecast on those two first pedals. But I would like to remind you, you need to keep thinking them and thinking them throughout the, le the lessons as you're, you're going through with your students. But you need to plan for how do I make the kids positively interdependent? How am I going to hold them individually accountable? It has to be in your planning as you put together the lesson. But as we said before, that just gets us across flat ground, not up the hills or down the hills. But to do that, if you remember, we need the gears. Now, I went by you pretty quickly and named those three gears. But knowing most teachers, you probably took some notes someplace. I'm going to ask you to see if you can recall the three different kinds of gears that there are in cooperative learning. Okay, if you remember, gear one is grouping, getting those students into those groups. Gear two, skills for getting started with the group activity. And gear three, gearing up, gearing down, those all important skills of group process skills, or as they are often called, social skills. What we're going to do is we're going to visit each of these gears in detail. We're going to take and look at each one, and probably this, not probably, definitely, this is where we will spend most of the telecast time. This is the place where if you want to throw the bicycle over a cliff, not ride it down or up, this is where it'll happen. If you just want to sort of drop it to the ground and forget it and say, <laughs> cooperative learning doesn't work in my classroom, this is probably where it will break down. So the more definitively we can understand how to structure in these group skills of grouping, getting started, and gearing up and gearing down, the better we'll run the bicycle. So let's take a look at them one at a time. Let's look at the grouping skill first. Now when I look at grouping, I need to be able to look at some very definitive pieces of information, and there will be three of them. We are going to look at environment, we are going to look at sorting, and we are going to look at management. Now again, in your study guides, you have all three of these listed. So I would invite you to turn the page. You'll see them there on page six of your study guide. I'd invite you to just take some notes as I discuss each of these areas for you. The first one, when I am talking about environment, what I need to do is I need to look at my classroom, I need to look at the walls, I need to look at the floor, I need to look at the ceiling, but most importantly I need to look at the furniture. And I need to say to myself, okay, how am I going to uh, best utilize what's here to be able to help kids group quickly, quietly, efficiently, and here's a big one, independently. I need to have that become their issue as soon as possible. So one of the things that's very important is to ask their advice. You know, we're going to be working in groups. What do you think we, need, we could do here with our furniture? Sometimes we want to be in twos. Sometimes we want to be in threes. Sometimes we want to be in fours. What do you think? And so we talk to them, and we talk to them and pull their wisdom from them. Looking at your furniture, it's also very, very important that you look at how it can be moved least amount of time, least amount of noise, least amount of confusion, independently, as I said. But it needs to be such that when they're finished, 
I mean, when they've moved the furniture, every student in the group can easily, emphasis easily, see each other, okay, every other member of the group. All members can see each other. The Johnsons, the uh, two Johnson brothers out of Minnesota call it uh, elbow to elbow and knee to knee. And so students have to be able to be close enough physically. Eye contact makes an, a very, very big difference in what happens in the groups. It's real easy if I want to check out of the group and if my chair is just back just a little bit, it's amazing what I can do to remove myself from what is happening in that group. Whereas if the furniture is such that I am committed to the group activity by position of my chair, position of my desk, I'm going to be a whole lot more likely to participate. So grouping becomes a real important um, consideration for me to, to think about. Environmentally, because a room can make or break cooperative learning. So that's, that's one thing to think about. Sorting. When I look at the issue of sorting, I have to first make a philosophical decision. Because we can take a look at the cooperative learning gurus in this country, and there are two differing philosophies about grouping. One philosophy is emerging that recommends that you ability balance the students in your group. If you're going to have three students, then have a, a higher achieving student, have an average student, and have a student in there who's, who's struggling. So you're going to kind of create the bell curve in, in your group around ability. The other philosophy says heterogeneously group your students. Just do it by the luck of the draw. Kind of mix them up, pull names, and, and there you are. Those you know, first names pull, the first four, those are a group of four, and so forth. So random, heterogeneous, versus structured, teacher chosen, ability balanced kinds of groups. You, as the individual teacher, you always the major decision maker, you must make that decision about which of those two philosophies you're going to embrace. The, um, it the, the variables would be you, your students, your curriculum, your background. I mean, there are a lot of things to factor in and consider. But you do need to make that real clear decision up front and in the beginning so that you know, you know how, how you stand with it. I'm going to share with you my particular bias. I, I prefer the heterogeneous grouping. I prefer doing the luck of the draw grouping. And there are some times I get some groups together that don't work as well. There are some times I have some wonderful, <laughs> gloriously happy accidents that I think, oh, that'll never work, and then I'm surprised. But the heterogeneous grouping removes the chance that students will sit there and start placing themselves on the curve. Because see, if I always ability group, it will take the students about five split seconds to figure out who's the sparrow, who's the bluebird, and who's the buzzard. Because kids do that, don't you agree? I really think that that, that happens. So my bias is toward heterogeneous grouping. Now I do do some ability grouping, but it's just folded into all the other random kinds of times so the kids don't even know what it is that I am doing. Okay. Now, what I'd suggest to you is that if you are going to heterogeneously group, you need some tricks up your sleeve to help you in, in doing that. One of the easiest that I know of, and you probably already know these, but I'm just going to run by a couple quick ones anyway, is to have the students number off. If I have in my classroom, I have 28 students, and I want four in a group, okay, I'm going to think about that for a minute, I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to have the kids number off one through seven. So they number off, and as they number off, I place these little folded number tents at station one. And I fold the, I put the folded number tents at station two, and so forth, so the students see where the seven stations are. Also, while they're numbering off, even if they're in high school, because kids, have, has this ever happened? Teacher, what's my number? I don't remember what my number is. Or kids switching numbers so that they can be in a group with their friends, maybe? Well have them track it. So person number one goes one, two, three, four, seven, okay? So that you, it, it's grounded. There, there it is. And then they go and they move, move to their location. So that one's a very common and one that I call kind of a quick and dirty way to, to, to group. 
Now I'll tell you these number tense are critical and important for you when you're doing cooperative learning because now you've got a wonderful way. Can I hear from group three, please? Can I hear from group four? And they're not going to forget which one they are because it's right there on one of the desks or on the table for them to look at. But now let me share with you another grouping strategy. This one is one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites for three reasons. One, now I can finally throw away all my greeting cards without guilt. Two, it lets the kids know something about me. And three, and again, it's a nice, quick, um, efficient, economical way to get kids into heterogeneous base groups. What I do is I take my greeting cards. Here's one of my greeting cards from Mother's Day, just recently passed, a couple weeks ago. And I cut it into four pieces if I want groups of four. So back to my 28 kids, I want seven groups. I take seven greeting cards and I just cut each one into four separate pieces. Now, on the back of one of the cards, I write, and on each of the piece, I write a number. So this is three, 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 and three. You see what that means is that these students, when they get the card, are going to automatically go to station three. This is where they're going to go. But then the A, the D, the C, the B, what these are for is that now I can use this to spot check. I can say, okay, I want to hear from all Bs in groups. Okay, and that means that in every group, the student who's a B is going to have to recite and give me, give me an answer. Or I can use it for assigning roles. If you're an A, you're the materials person. If you're a D, you're the noise monitor. If you're a C, you're the speaker. If you're a B, you're the recorder. So it gives me a way to be able to have a lot of control and a lot of um, direct influence with the groups even though I don't have to really talk to them at all. So numbering off and greeting cards, two real quick ways for heterogeneously grouping students. Under grouping, would you put three numbers? Two, three, four and put it underlined and put anything on there that says this is major important. You shouldn't have kids work in groups of larger than four. And of course, if they're less than two, they're not a group. So twos, threes, and fours are the best number configurations for students in our schools. And of course, if you're working in primary, you're going to spend a lot of time with twos before you start working about getting up into the, the other more complex numbers. As adult groups, we can work up to groups of eight and do fine. But students just don't have those group process skills. And as adult groups, we should never be in more than groups of groups larger than eight because there just are too many air channels. And somebody's always going to check out, and somebody's always going to take over. And we don't want that to happen in, in groups. So groups of two, three, or four. OK? That's the second part of our grouping gear. Now remember we're on the gears. This is grouping. We've talked about environment. We've talked about sorting. Now a couple words about management. Management is that technique of setting up group agreements with my students. I'm going to set up group agreements that say um, what do you, how do you think we should run these groups? What things do you think we need to do? Now I'll tell you what I did that was a real serious mistake the first time I did cooperative learning. I marched right in and I said, kids, you're going to love this. We're going to do cooperative groups. Here are the seven things we're going to do. Ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop. And I laid out the rules. I know better because I know that that sets up a real sabotage kind of thing for some of our kids whose very style is to be a rule challenger. So instead to say to kids, we're going to work in groups. Let's talk about what this means. What do you think we should do? Pull the rules from them. Ask them to help you determine what's the best interrupting signal to use. Ask them about what's a good level of, of voices and how are we going to make sure that, that that occurs that way. Ask them um, about uh, you know, how they're going to help each other to stay on task when, when they're in, in their groups. Now one of the things that you might consider sort of leading them to is um, the fact that they are going to need to cue in as to whether or not they're working in cooperative groups. I call it cueing the crowd. I use that, though, for us as teachers. Let me explain this, and then you can
can think about whether or not you'd want to do this with your kids and how you might want to do it. Cueing the crowd is exactly what it means. If I'm working and I want my, I mean, if I want my kids working in small cooperative groups, I can do it just as simply as this. Just take a piece of Xerox paper and I just write the words on it and it says cooperative groups and I can tape it on the wall. There it is. When I switch from cooperative groups, I put the sign up that says whole class. Because see, the rules are different. What the student's role is different. Here, the student needs to focus on me and is somewhat dependent and interdependent just with me. Here, I don't want the student dependent on me at all. I want him interdependent with the, the, the other students in, in the group. So it's, it's like a switch of mindsets. And so having the notion of cueing the crowd might help a great deal. The other thing I'd invite you to do is to have your students record the rules if they're old enough and are, you know, have writing skills. Have them make a poster. Have them make a video that says, here's how we use groups in this school. Or have them make a booklet with an accompanying audio tape. Those can all be extra credit assignments, or it can be an actual assigned assignment. You can then use those tapes and those booklets as new students join your class so you know what the rules are. But they also become theirs. I made too many of the things that go into the classroom. Then they're mine. If I have more, the students more involved in doing that, they, it is more theirs. So it's an important consideration for us to, to keep here in, in our minds, OK? Now, there is gear two. Let's look quickly. I'm sorry, <laughs> there's gear one, grouping. Now let's look quickly at gear two. Gear two has to do with getting started. I need, if my students are going to be able to do a good job in their groups, they're going to need to know how to get started. And you know, they're not the only ones. I do a lot of cooperative learning with adult groups, and I'll put up the objective, and I'll say what everything's going to happen, and then they wait. Because we're pretty much conditioned to be taught directly. So it's real important that kids learn how to become self-starters in their groups, that second gear. I mean, we're actually physically here now. We're all organized, and we've got our agreements, and we're ready to go. Let's go. There's a saying that said, if you just sit on the right track, you'll get run over. And so grouping gear gets you on the right track, but you've got to go, or you're going to get run over. How do we do that? We need to look at three things. We need to look at objectives, we need to look at roles, and we need to look at methods. And we're going to do a quick jigsaw in order to be able to do that in, in your, your viewing sites right now. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at page 7 of your packets, please, of your, of your study guides. And we're, uh, I'm going to ask you also to form trios very quickly. Would you do that? And following this exercise, we're going to give you a break, because I know you've been sitting for a long time. But if you can just kind of hang, hang in there with us for a minute, we're going to give you a chance here to um, internalize some of this information for gear two. So if you would quickly get into trios. If you're viewing by yourself, again, you're going to have to kind of vicariously imagine what the group activity would be here. Now, would you? Um, Letter off, A, B, and C. Decide who's A, who's B, who's C, just as quickly as you can in your trios. OK? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to jigsaw some information. And we're going to jigsaw the information that's on page 7. Here's the assignment for this information. If you have letter C, you are going to do objectives. So look at page 7, and you mark C there next to objectives, so you remember that you do that. If you have letter B, <coughs> you are going to do roles on page 7. And if you have letter A, you are going to do methods. Now, what does do mean? Let me share with you the objective of your jigsaw activity. In this activity, you have two specific objectives. One. Everybody in the group will, all members will, understand three specific techniques for helping students get started in their groups. 
Okay? So that means everybody's going to understand about objectives, everybody's going to understand about roles, and everybody's going to understand about methods. That's your task objective. But you also have a trust objective. You're to practice praising each other. So when somebody comes up with a particularly clear rendition of one of these, you're to say, nice job, or that was real clear, or wow, that really makes sense to me, or some such things like that. Okay? You have a total of five minutes to read your activity, paraphrase it, teach it back to your other group, and make sure that everybody does understand all three pieces. Okay? Five minutes. Welcome back. Hopefully in your sharing, in your trios, you learn from each other about objectives, roles, and methods, three parts of Gear 2. What I'd like to do now is summarize the information for you that I think is of paramount importance. And I'd like you to um, sort of look at this summarization as a chance for you to compare what you know. Okay? So that at the end of the time you would say, yes, gee, I knew that, I knew that, I got an A, or yes, I knew that. So it's a chance for you to do your first level of debriefing here on this activity that you did, even though it was very, very short. So let's take a look at the information first about objectives. When we look at group objectives, we need to make sure that we always have two, just like you had two in this activity. The task objective is always the job as a learner. Now here, under this task objective, you could have a couple of things. Like you could have had to uh, have learned about the three different terms, and then you could have had to uh, write group definitions. I mean, there's, you know, you're not limited to uh, two totally. You can have s more than one under task, but it's a good idea to only have one under trust. How did we work together as a team? because then the students can do some more specific practice in, in that. But they will always have a task objective, the job, and they will always have a trust objective, which is really their working as a team, their use of social skills. You also looked at the fact that these objectives should be written down, as we had said before, and make sure that they stay written. The problem with putting them on the overhead is that when you, you know, just like here, when I move this, then they're gone. So it's a real important thing for you to be able to put them either on the chalkboard or on newsprint or a flip chart or something like that and uh, keep them posted during the activity. Spoken, just like when our uh, objective, I said, um, who is, you know, you, you need to be able to articulate back what, what they are. And like I should have said, you know, like person C, the person C in the group, would you please clar clarify what the objective is? You need to say it, and the students need to say it, so that you're sure, again, that those external processors are getting the objectives. We know the importance of teaching to an objective, so being sure that the lesson gets off to a good beginning is crucial and critical. Objectives is one thing, and if you look on page 8 of your packet, you will see the things that I have just said to you there in their um, hieroglyphic sort of form as some reminders of that. Roles, if you will look at page 9 of your, your packet, of your study guide, you'll see a role page that if you wish, you could just um, put through the copy machine, copy several times, and uh, cut it up and be able to just pass out roles. If you want a noise monitor in your group, then you would take the noise monitor role. If you want a praiser, you would take that one. And you could just distribute them at the tables, and the students could pick, pick a role, and that's what they would do in the activity that day. But then methods needs some additional thought and consideration. Now, I had mentioned to you that I am not a researcher, and all of the information that I have been sharing with you today, I have gleaned from the gurus and the experts, those people who have done a phenomenal job of developing models for us. But this little piece is probably my one independent contribution to our, you know, to cooperative learning wisdom. What this says is that I, as the teacher, have got to make a decision about the method. Am I going to straight out say to the kids, here's how I want you to do it in the group? So am I going to actually, specifically say, follow this prescription in your group? 
or am I going to make a suggestion about how it should be done, or am I just going to pose the problem or the task for the group and let them develop their own method. I need to pre-think that. There are times it's better for me to let the group develop their own method, that that's the best learning out of the whole activity. There are times when they need to make a decision about whether or not to follow what I said. And then there are times when I'm just going to straight out say, like I did to you, please read it, paraphrase it, get ready, teach it to your group. And I was, you know, it was very brief, but I did tell you specifically what I wanted you to do. So that's an important pre-thought sort of decision. Objectives, roles, and methods. When visiting a classroom recently, I had the opportunity to watch a teacher use the jigsaw technique very effectively in working with a, a group of students teaching a lesson on the heart. The teacher had the students divided up into four groups. The first group was working with the available technology in the classroom and getting information from the online encyclopedia. The second group again working with the technology and a listening center activity gathering information from that area. The third group then, Judy, was using the uh, video disc technology in the classroom and getting science information from a video disc program. And then there was also a group working with some offline printed materials. So yeah. a variety of things going on, kind of infusing that technology into the jigsaw technique. Absolutely. You know, jigsaw can be one of, the, uh, one of the things that supports technology. Technology can be one of the things that supports the jigsaw in cooperative learning. So it's a wonderful sort of a symbiotic sort of, sort of a relationship. And I think it's real important that uh, as classroom teachers, we realize how, how much of an integral part of cooperative learning technology can be because it can be a Absolutely. marvelous addition. We're ready to take some calls for Judy now. Do we have someone on the line with a question? Yes, I have a question, please. Yes? How should I grade students on their work in groups? Ah, good question. <laughs> good question. One of the things that it, there's so much confusion right now about um, grading and how you grade and there are so many horror stories where teachers have gone into group grades too soon and um, then Harvey and Hilda's Harvard's mom and dad have come down and said what my student has never had a C before in their life and da 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 and so it gets very very complex I would suggest to you do not group grade too soon. Get your grades out of the individual account accountability checks as you first start. It's an unfair thing to do to students to put them into that group situation when they don't have the group skills yet and, and don't know how to function and do the group dynamics in the group process and yet then we grade them on a, on a total product. Now we can give um, completion points, we can give uh, you know, a, a, some sort of an accountability um, factor in there where we can, like I say, give, give uh, points toward extra rewards or something like that. But when it comes down to fo final grading, I would really encourage you to hold off in doing that prematurely because it winds up sabotaging the model. The thing that I often say to teachers is, okay, let's say that we decide that we are going to collaboratively work and plan to raise the test scores of all the kids in biology here in our high school. And uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll all get a raise commensurate with how many points all of the kids get, you know, in go up on the scale. We as adults would get real angry and upset about that, and I think that happens a lot with our cooperative gr groups in the classroom. So I'd say to you, go with individual accountability checking, give participation credit, give finishing credit, so it's more of a quantifiable as, as opposed to a qualifiable accounting to begin with. After kids have done this for a year, then we can start to hold them accountable for some of the, you know, the group grading. Does that help? Okay. Thanks, Judy. We have another caller on the line. Do you have a question for Judy? Yes. I'm still not clear on the difference between trust objectives and task objectives. Do you think oh. you could elaborate a little okay. bit more on that and perhaps give me an example? Thank you. Um, anytime any group is working together, 
they're doing two things. They're getting jobs done, that's task. And they're building a sense of team, that's trust. And when you set up cooperative groups for kids, you're always giving them something they have to do, something they're having to learn, something they have to complete, something they have to build. Uh, in Paula's example, they were learning about the heart, and they had to come up with uh, compilations of information that were going to be added into a whole class report. That's the task objective. The lesson that I had you do, your task was to uh, read your part of either objective, role, or method, and the other two people were to read their part, and then the whole group was to teach each other so that at the end of it, everybody understood about objective, role, and method. That was the task. But the trust part is what kind of a social skill am I having those students practice? What kind of a team building sort of skill or technique am I asking the students to use as they're completing their assignment. So in, in your activity that I gave you in the telecast, it was praising, to practice praising one another. Does, does that help? So see, one, another way to think about it is one is a head objective. I do, this, I do it in my thinking part. The other is almost a heart objective. It's like you know a relationship building objective. Does that help? Yes. OK, thanks for asking the question. That okay. needed clarifying. Thank you. We'll have the opportunity for some more questions later. Good. Should we move to the next part, Judy? Sounds good. Well, we have looked at um, gears one and two. Now we're ready to ready for the most complex of all of the pieces and parts of cooperative learning, and we're ready to take a look at gear three. Gear three we called gearing up and gearing down, or another name for it could be group process skills, group dynamics skills, that whole collection of things, that complex, complex collection of skills and techniques that we need in order to be a good team player. No small task to be able to get this piece of information across to, to students. If you would please, I'd invite you at this point to look at page 11 of your study guides again there you see a sort of modified scope and sequence list of some possible social skills. Now, I'm only going to let you look at that page if you make me a promise. The promise is this. You will not take that page and say, I have to do it all yesterday perfectly. Because I think that as teachers, we tend to do that for ourselves. You know, if I have to do this much, I have to do it all immediately, and, it can't, and I can't you know, have any mistakes in the procedure and the process. One of the things that I think causes cooperative learning to get short-circuited a lot is that we take on too many of the social skills in, in a teaching event. There are two things I have to do. One is I have to decide which social skills am I going to teach my students over the course of this school year. And then I need to have a variety of techniques for doing that. On the which social skills, I strongly urge and recommend that when you look at page 11, you just pick three to five of them and you teach them very well. It will make it much simpler for you, much more understandable for students. They're going to be practicing many more than just the three to five that you teach. But really emphasize those. And those three to five you probably will teach like I'm teaching you right now, direct instruction, where you will actually be doing some things with them directly teaching the information. I think it will be good if you could look at me doing just that in a classroom. I would invite you to watch. This is um, a, an elementary classroom. And I went in just as a guest teacher for the day. And I was going around to all the classrooms. And in this particular class, I am teaching a social skill. Let's just take a look at this group of children. And I think it might give you some clarification of gear three. We're going to work in partners in a minute. But first, we're going to do something where we're going to be together as a whole class. And when we're together as a whole class, I would like you to keep doing what you're doing right now. You're looking at me, both your eyes are nice and wide open, 
and both of your ears are nice and wide open and your mouth is only open to breathe and to smile but it's not talking so that's what I'd like you to keep doing until I ask you some questions okay now we're going to work together and we're going to do something in our partners and we're going to share and take turns because we're going to be taking turns we need to figure out just exactly what does that mean now this is what it looks like when i print it up here let's all say it together so we hear what it sounds like take turns say it again that was really good. Now, we know what it looks like. We know what the words sound like. Now let's decide what does that mean. You raise your hand if you think you can tell me what taking turns means. Uh, Kayla? Yes. person to finish and then we start good thanks uh stephanie you you like uh, yeah you give one person something and then the other person something so oh. it back. great we're going to share we're going to share and we're going to wait what else are we going to do some more students um, working on developing a, a description definition of the social skill of taking turns. Those are obviously primary age students, but you can do a very similar kind of thing even with high school students. It's um, always surprising to me as I work with secondary students, and my original background in education was at the secondary level, and then I moved to elementary and um, now I move all and up, all, you know, up and down all the instructional levels as a teacher trainer. Well, I I'm always surprised to see how secondary students really don't yet know how to share or to take turns. Now you have to call it by fancier names, um, but it is a real key kind of, uh, of a skill for students to be able to have in order to successfully work in groups. One of the things I'd like to suggest to you is, is that, and I'd mentioned it to you before, you need two really skill collections here. You need to have the skill of having made the decision of which social skills you're going to teach your, your students. So you've got that decision set. But then you need this whole repertoire, these ideas of how to teach your students. If I could reference you now to page 12 of your study guide, there's a whole list there of some possibilities, and I'm just going to uh, very quickly talk, walk you through this page and give you some suggestions of things that make a difference and can help you when you are trying to teach the social skills to students. Now remember I said you're going to pick three to five and you're going to teach them often. So I could teach uh, something like sharing or I could teach something like listening and I could teach it by six of these different techniques over the course of a school year. 
and I, we just keep adding to our understanding of it because um, if it were not so, you know, if it were not so complex, communication wouldn't be, you know, one of the things that causes groups to break down so much. So, and we're really talking about communication and group process skills here. So look at, if you would, at, at page 12. One real common way that I can do social skill instruction for students is the good old fashioned, you know, role play kind of a technique. I can have students, I could have had those primary students, I could have taken two or three of them aside and sort of set up a role play where they modeled first what taking turns was and then they could have modeled what taking turns wasn't and we could have done a description for those. You can do that again K through 12 on any of the social skills. Cartoons are a marvelous, marvelous source of teaching social skills. You start reading um, Snoopy and you know all of those other, you know, the, just the, the funny papers on Sunday becomes a social skill instruction opportunity, not to mention cartoon books like Far Side and a few of the others. And so I strongly, strongly urge for you to kind of look through those and you know you can put, you can run it on an overhead or you can do something and put it up there and then say to the students, okay, what social skill is missing here? What social skill is obvious here? So cartoons are a fun way to introduce it and in getting, getting the students to start to talk about a certain social skill. Monitoring is a big one. You know, we had mentioned to you before, I mentioned to you when I was in conversation with Paula about the book uh, written by LeBeouf of the, um, uh, the greatest management principle of the world and that what gets done is what gets rewarded is that management principle. Well, you really do need to monitor. We do respect what the boss inspects. So if you have asked me if my trust objective and all the things we're talking about here are not all going to be trust objectives, that's all of what page 11 is, the things that I do to build trust. Um, what, if, if you've asked me to practice praising and you're sitting at your desk you know, correcting papers while we're doing our group activity, I'm not going to be very inclined probably to practice praising unless I'm really intrinsically motivated. So instead, what we need to do is we need to monitor. And so while I teach, I am working, I walk around a whole lot, very actively monitoring and watching. And so I would watch, and when I notice over here in group one, students doing a particularly good job of praising, I write it down. I apply the Blanchard principle here of catch them doing it right. If I see some real inappropriate information about not praising, I'll also write that down. But I'm going to monitor and go around and check from group to group to group. Then later when we're debriefing and students are telling me what they think about how they did, I'll share the good news that I saw. I'll share good things that I heard the different groups doing. I will share with the students whom I heard the inappropriate information from. I'll share with them privately and individually, not, not publicly, because I really believe about never doing anything to you know, deter from the dignity of a student. It would probably not also give them a very positive feeling about cooperative learning. So those inappropriate kinds of things I would deal with more privately. But by monitoring, I can get a lot of um, praising happen. I mean, if they see me coming close and they start to figure out, oh, gee, what can I praise? Now, at first it's contrived, and it feels kind of phony and artificial, but it gets into their repertoire, and it gets into their habit base, and that's what we want to have happen. Talking chips is another little fun one. This is an idea from the author of Kagan. It has some great, um, real practical kinds of ideas. You take chips, just simple chips, and you give each student X number of chips. Might be five, might be 10, might be seven. And that student, whenever they talk in the group, they put in a chip, okay? So after a student has talked three times, and you can even do it by color if you so wish, that three green chips will be in. That means that person's talked three, this person's talked two, this person is only talked once, this person has talked a lot. You can set it up that at the end of the time, all chips must be deposited, meaning that every student needs to have been equitably involved. Everybody has practiced taking turns. Do you see how this could be a technique for monitoring that particular social skill? So talking chips is a real simple but a real doable 
acti you know, technique for teaching social skills. Movie clips are wonderful. So you, you, know, you start watching movies and looking at them from a different perspective and you think, ah, there is a perfect example of not taking turns, or there's a perfect example of listening, or there's a, you start watching both television and movies through a different view, and you just show the clip to the students and then again ask them, what social skill is that? How would we define it? How would we practice it? How does it sound? How does it look here in this particular classroom? Puppets. Now when I taught secondary, when I taught language arts and social studies in the senior high, you wouldn't have been able to pay me to put a puppet on my hand. No way. Absolutely not. In fact, that's why I went into secondary education. But then when by pure circumstance and happenstance that I never chose, but I'm forever eternally grateful, I wound up teaching kindergarten, puppets became a mainstay in, in my repertoire of teaching. Puppets are great for teaching social skills, and I have used puppets in some of the secondary level classrooms, and it is astounding. I don't go in and do a puppet play for the high school kids. I go in with two puppets, and I say, if you were going to go and visit a first grade classroom, and you wanted to teach listening with puppets, and here you've got two puppets, what would you do? And they have to design the puppet play. And then I've had kids actually go and visit and present the puppet play amazing kinds of things that can happen, cross-grade kinds of helping and, and other sort of things. So puppets are a wonderful possibility. We might think that Saddam Hussein could use some social skill instruction about sharing. Newspaper articles are full of information of the lack of social skills. Lots and lots of it. A few human interest stories where even there is some example of a positive use of social skills. You can bring newspaper articles in. They can be your set for teaching the lesson. They can be ongoing examples. If we are practicing, for instance, the um, social skill of learning to uh, disagree properly, we can put up a bulletin board, divide it in half, and on one half of the bulletin board put all the articles we can find where people in the real world have disagreed appropriately. On this side of the bulletin board, we can put all the articles we find where people have not disagreed appropriately. Some good information, and it almost always winds up as evidence for the need for more social skill instruction. And it's true. It really is, you know, it's an absolute true reality. The T-chart is probably the most commonly used, best known technique for teaching social skills. And it's a simple device, really, and is, is very useful. The only thing is I'm, I worry about it getting overused because it's kind of the one that shows up in so many of the how-to books on cooperative learning. But let's just take a quick look at the T-chart and see what it, what it looks like. The T-chart is called that because it looks like this. You write in this section up here the social skill that we're talking about. Let's say that we are talking about the social skill of praising. Okay? Here, in this side, we are going to, and we could put an eye, and over this side we can put an ear. And my art always needs uh, some, some explanation. This is not a lima bean with a mutation. This is actually my um, attempt at an ear. But this says, what does praising look like? What does praising sound like? And you ask the students then to describe, and you record down here things that they say. Praising looks like um, a smile. It looks like thumbs up. It looks like um, nodding. It looks like applause or hands clapping, maybe would you'd need to say, what does it sound like? Way to go, um, awesome. And again, that's going to change what students are going to say to you, and you heard that in the clip that you just saw. What they're going to say is going to be different at different grade levels, but it's still a good way to be able to get the information. You record it, but then turn it over to the students and have them make their own charts again. I strongly recommend always that you have the students do as much of the recording and the um, compiling of the information of what it means for us to be doing cooperative learning 
because then again it is more theirs than ours and that's a real important thing that we're trying to to do with with the students induction is um, any time that you don't tell the students but you pull the definition from from them you can just plain old put up a social skill you could say we're going to use the social skill of consensus you could put that up there you could have groups brainstorm what that means you could have the whole class brainstorm what that means then you could look it up and you could uh, circle critical attributes and you could erase things that were wrong by that you induct you induce what is the definition of uh, of, of praising. So there, you know, that's another way to do the social skills. Ordering strips is another of Kagan's idea, and you would take, if you will look again here at the overhead with what we had with praising, you would take these words and you would actually cut them apart. You'd have them actually typed up or done on the computer on strips and they would be passed out then to students. Each student would have three praise strips and then they have to wait for the appropriate moment and that it ha when something happens in their group and then they put it in the middle and they state the praise statement. Now it, can't, it can be used with other than just praising but again it's another sort of a way. It becomes, it's a very again forced arbitrary kind of practice and the kids will say this feels weird this feels dumb I mean you're you know we have to say these things because we have these strips and they're right but ultimately it gets it started it gets the ball rolling not all ideas are going to be right for all groups all teachers all social skills I'm just trying to give you a real blitz quick kind of potpourri because this is one of the more difficult parts one of the kind of uh, bugaboo parts for us in, in the cooperative learning. Then stories, the actual literature. Have kids look in literature, both children's stories, middle stories, senior high stories. There's a lot of examples of social skills in their lack. And then good old mind mapping or webbing or clustering. And if you don't know what that one is, you're going to have to ask somebody who does because I'm not going to have. You just put the main idea here in the middle, and then you put stems on the outside of, 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 what, that, of what that is. You can never have too many ideas for how to teach social skills, but you can have too many social skills that you think you need to teach. What I'm going to ask you to do at this point is to, again, group at your viewing sites. I'm going to ask you to group in fours. And I want you to talk about social skills and which social skills might you teach. Now, as you do that, I want you to reference some pages in your study guide again. Page 13 shows a modified T chart. It's more than a T. It's what's called a quadrant chart because with that one you would do what a social skill looks like and doesn't look like, sounds like, and doesn't sound like. So it gets the, the negative in there as well as the positive. Some teachers say that works real well because it helps kids learn to what to eliminate. Other teachers say they already know too much what the negative is. I don't even want it, want it emphasized. Page 14 and 15, and please feel free if you would choose to use these yourself, make overheads of them, and, and, and use them if, if you would like as a, a gift from me and from Jostens. Uh, but you could put the first one up on your, on your overhead. You put your transparency up, page 14. Have the students give you responses and fill that in. But then put up page 15 and say, okay, this is what the experts say. And look, you've had, and every group of kids I've ever worked with can get almost everything that's on this list, plus they get some good things that isn't, that are not on this list. So something that you may want to use, plus pages 16 and 17, ways of accepting and giving, giving and accepting a compliment. So just some sort of suggested starting kinds of ideas. And again, feel free to make an overhead if it would be appropriate for you with pages 16 and 17, okay? Would you please, you know, we're not going to have a long time for this sharing. It's going to be real quick. But would you please, um, you, can, you can either go, you know, pairs, trios, or quartets, whatever seems to be the most logical grouping. But just have a very quick discussion. What social skills do you think you would emphasize with your students? And what might be one of the techniques that I've mentioned that you would like to use? Okay? Thank you. Quite a model, isn't it? Quite a model, quite a lot of things.
things to think about. I want to remind you what I said earlier when we started. Nobody is an immediate overnight expert in cooperative learning, and nobody has ever done learning about it. But it's such a powerful additional tool into our teaching repertoire. We need now to look at the fourth and final principle, that kickstand. You know, kicking down that kickstand and talking about the trip. This is a step that is most often left out. And it's usually left out because teachers say, ah, I don't have time. It's just like now as we're getting into the waning minutes of this telecast and we're thinking, oh, let's see, how can we monitor and adjust with schedule and, and, and whatever. Um, I am going to suggest to you that no matter what, the debriefing should be done. If you would, please, would you turn to page 18 of your study guide? I'm not going to take time at this point and have you write your own definition. I'll have you do that at another time. But I would like to give you a formal definition for you to be able to jot down on that page. And this page, like the, or this definition, like the others, has all the critical attribute pieces in it that says, you know, these are the things that you need to have in the, in the debriefing. Essentially, debriefing is this. It's evaluating two things. It's evaluating how well we did on the work. That's the task objective. Then it's evaluating how well we worked together. If I had been able to actually be with you as you were doing objectives, roles, and methods, I would have had you debrief. How well do you know now objectives, roles, and methods? That was your task objective. And then I would say, how well did you work on praising? How did you do? Did you praise anybody? Did you remember to do that? What was the circumstance? So we would debrief and we would talk about that. That is debriefing. Now debriefing can take as little as two minutes. It can take as much as 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how long has been the cooperative activity preceding it. But because time is always such a bugaboo for all of us in education, a thing we seem to never, other than money, have enough of, I'd like to offer you just a real simple but powerful kind of way to be able to help kids do closure and do debriefing. Now this debriefing is debriefing that students are doing of themselves and their efforts in the learning both on the task and the trust objective. And that's where we need to start. If your kids get real mature, they can say, how well they think the group did. But in the beginning, have the kids just evaluate their own level. That will relate, that will come in to help you to uh, the lady who had the question about kids with group grades because they can do some self grading. So if I were going to ask you now to debrief how well you know objectives, roles, and methods, I could say, okay, class, we're going to debrief how well we did. We're going to use a scale of zero to five. Zero means Objectives, roles, methods, what? I mean, you know, I didn't get anything. One is I've got a teeny tiny bit of information. Two is I've got a small amount of information. Three is I've got about half of it. Four is, hey, I'm on the upside of things. And five, wow, I've really got this down. I know all about objectives, roles, and methods. So do you see that zero to five scale? You teach the scale to students. Now, even if the bell is just about to ring, and you know that it's about to ring, and so you say to kids, oh, okay, you can start gathering up your stuff and, and putting your desks back into rows because the next class that comes in here doesn't use cooperative learning or whatever you need to do. But while you're doing that, I want you to think how well you did on the, on the task. Did you do a zero to five? Where, where were you? How well did you do? Was it good, bad, indifferent? Okay, think how well you did. Think it in your head. And you ask the students to do that. Now you saw on the screen there where you could actually do it in writing and they could circle it and turn it in. If you don't have time to turn, pass out the papers like that, you still can do it. Because you say to kids, okay, think it, all right? Turn and look at the folks back in your group. Just stand up and turn to them and go, one, two, three. And on three, they're going to register what they think their vote was. So if I put down four fingers, then Paula would ask me, well, why do you think four? And I'd say, well, because I, did, I think I've got them all down. I'm still a little fuzzy about how you assign roles, but I'm getting clearer about it. If I only put a one, that would say I didn't have this down very well at all. OK, so do you see how one, two, boom, and you can just you can get that registered. If you don't even have time for kids to do that in the group together, you can do it as an exit requirement. OK, think your grade. I want you to show me as you walk out this door. And so as kids walk by you, they are showing you what they think their grade from 0 to 5 is on how well they did on the task. 
You can have them show one hand task and one hand trust, although then they drop their, their books. You can evaluate one of the objectives or the other one, or if you have time, you can do, you can do both. Your teeny tiny kids, you can do, I did great, I did average, I didn't do so good this time. So you've got lots of possibilities, but by doing that, you can get it to go very, very quickly. You can also do it in a more elaborate sort of form, and if you'll look at your packet just very quickly, I just like, would like you to look at the next pages that are there for your use later on, so you can continue um, to have the students debrief. You can use scales. There are two of them there on page 19, one with just pictures for the little kids who still don't, haven't got their numbers yet. The 0 to 5 that we just did, if you aren't going to go, you know, like, like this, but you want the kids to actually circle it and maybe sign their name, and they can even write a sentence of rationale under each one of these. Do you see how you can expand or contract this depending on how much time you have? You can give a ladder, like you see on the page here, where on page 20, the students then uh, can take their, um, their names and they can just write wherever they think they are relative to what the group did, and then the group turns in one ladder for the whole quartet or the whole group. The other thing you can do is you can use questions if you prefer. You can, have the you can give the students one question like, what could we do differently next time? Did group members share? You know, any of those questions that are there, or any others that you could make up, I would only choose one. I'd write it on the chalkboard or write it on the overhead and have students write their response. If they don't have time to write their response, they can say it to you as they're going out the door. The other thing is you can have open-ended statements. You can put one of those up. I hope that. I learned. I was pleased. I still need. And you could take one or two of these depending on what kind of information you wanted to generate for the students. You can mix and match any of these debriefing forms. I just would hope that I convinced you not to not debrief, because even in the shortest, quickest, tightest of timelines, it's crucial that we take time to close the circle. You know, so many of our learning theorists and our learning researchers have taught us about the importance of immediacy and recency. The things said first and the things said last tend to be the things that I remember the most. So if I can come back and, you know, look at what it was I was supposed to do, first you tell us what we're supposed to do in our group, and then if I can come back and say how well I did it, it tends to pull the stuff together and will make it less likely even that I lose some of that stuff here in, in the middle. So very important kinds of concepts and um, issues that we don't want to, to lose sight of. Four different parts to our model. Four parts to our bicycle. We, me. Positive interdependence, that mutuality stuff, accountability, I got to do my stuff, and I got to take it with me. Group skills, and now debriefing. We've thrown an awful lot of information at you. I hope the organizing metaphor helps some. I think it did, and I know that uh, viewers have probably been writing down some questions for you, Judy, as I have. So let's see if we have a call, uh, someone who'd like to ask Judy a question. Hello? Yes, I have a question. My principal is a big believer in the quiet classroom is the most productive classroom. And as I experiment with cooperative learning techniques, my classroom gets a little noisy. How do you think I can get him to come around and see that cooperative learning really is an active, productive activity to be happening in my classroom? Let me add him. <laughs> um, that's a really good, good question because I keep thinking I wish I had back all the minutes I tried to spend kids, you know, teaching kids to be quiet. Quiet does not mean learning, as you well know. One of the things that you can do is you can set that as a learning goal and even in, you know, recruit him as your coach. Have him help you learn about it, and in so doing, he may learn some things about it. Maybe have ask him to read with you the uh, journal that Paula mentioned from Ed Leadership. 
looking at some of the training tapes and cooperative learning together, maybe with him. And, and you know, in a role of really having him be your instructional leader and your um, supervisory sort of sort of coach, bring him into the classroom and actually involve him in a cooperative lesson. Um, ask him if you could help him in a staff meeting, and this is probably, I think, the most powerful way, where a whole lot of information has to maybe be uh, looked over. You're, you're doing a new curriculum adoption or something, and you help set up part of that staff meeting in a cooperative learning sort of format and have him watch what happens. Instead of um, staff meeting becomes sit and get, I came, I saw, I concurred, it becomes more of a processing and true decision-making sort of arena. That may help to, um, you know, get him on board a little bit. Does that help at all? Yes, it does. Good. I think I'm going to have to invite him to come in and work with me and the students on a cooperative activity. Maybe that would convince him. I think that that really, you know, because he'll find... Now, the, the other thing is that Cooperative learning is not quiet, but it's also not chaos when it's done correctly. And so if he can see that within these structures, there's still control, I think that that would help a lot. Well, Judy, let me ask this then. What about as an administrator? How can I get my teachers to work more cooperatively? Again, I would, I would utilize that wonderful uh, period of time called a staff meeting. Because in a 25-minute staff meeting, you can usually accomplish much more if you'll do some cooperative learning rather than that just you know sit and get kind of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, format which is deathly when we're all tired after we've all taught all day or we're anxious to get out and get into the classroom in the morning. The other thing that uh, the principal can do is to borrow the classroom. If you're my administrator, Paula, if you say, hey, you know what, I took this class and I'm just dying to get in and try it, could I borrow your class? I mean, <laughs> I, Wouldn't that be I, great? Think, I think you would get a convent, <laughs> or convert immediately, you know, so maybe a whole convent of converts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would be terrific. Yeah, those would be some ideas. We do have some other callers on the line. Question for Judy. Yes. I would like to know, what do I do with those one or two students that just don't seem to be able to take responsibility for their own learning? Yes. <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, one of the things that you um, can do in the initial stages is you want to build up cooperative learning as this great and wonderful thing that we all want to be involved in and that everybody's going to learn and everybody's going to grow. I mean, you really have to be a salesperson for, for, the, you know, for the model. But if you get um, a child that whatever group he or she is in, that they're a real detriment to what's happening in that group. I would sit down with that child. It, I mean, and this doesn't happen immediately. I mean, they have to be convincing me that they're into sabotaging this thing. Um, I would sit down with him or her, talk about the issue, and talk about choices and consequences, and that say that you have obviously made a choice not to learn to work in cooperative groups. And, you know, I'm sorry about that because when you go out in the work world, it'll be important that you know how to work in cooperative groups. And, you know, give them some of that other evidence. It's easier. It's more fun. Um, but you, you have made the choice. So I'm going to have you come over here. And they've got four people doing the job here. You have to do all of the job here by yourself. It doesn't usually take them too long before they go. And I do a whole lot of, you know, the kind of the proximity sort of monitoring of uh, control of, I'm watching, and I do hold the student. I mean, there's going to be some, you know, missed recesses or some missed athletic events or something where I'm going to hold that student accountable that he or she does all of that work themselves. That sometimes will help that student choose to want to learn to be in the group because I'll say, as soon as you're ready and you can articulate for me and show me that you can make good choices about how to be in groups again, I'll sure, I sure want to put you there because I know you'll get more out of it. So that would be one thing you could do with a student, even maybe a written contract. Be sure that student knows very specifically what the social skills are and maybe even might need to do some private practice with you. It's astounding how some students, because of background and value systems and other kinds of things, just don't know how to say, I need help, or that was great, or, and so some private kind of practice can possibly help. Okay, there is another caller on the line. Do you have a question for Judy? Hello? 
Michael? Okay. <laughs> it appears we might have lost that caller. Judy, I'd like to go back to the advanced student in the class. Can you just very briefly tell me, what do I do with that student who kind of wants to take over the group and, and is answering all of the questions? How do I work more effectively with that student? Talking chips. If, uh, you know, there's some real definitive control kinds of structures because one of the things, you'll notice that on the role page I gave you, there's no role that says leader. No one student is ever the leader. It's always a distributive sort of, sort of leadership. Um, and so you can have some real controlled, specific kinds of structures that way that only so many times can this person talk. You can have that person be the recorder because while they're recording, they can't talk all that, that much. Um, you can uh, watch very much for, again, catching that person listening and, and positively re reinforce whenever you notice that they have been a good listener, trying to emphasize that all-important sort of, sort of skill. Mm -hmm. And what about bringing out the, the real shy person again, another... The, the, that, that, that's a little harder sometimes to do, but my experience is that when groups are, first we do pairs and then we can do trios and then we do quartets, um, that is if we take it developmentally and we take it slow enough and we build it safe enough, usually that shy student is more likely to participate in a group of two or three or four than they are in a group of 27, 28, or 29. So it, it almost um, invites that student to, to come forward. But again, the actual strips can sometimes help with that because then the thing is said right there on the page for the student. Okay? Thank you. Wonderful information, Judy. Thank you. And it was great fun. Thank you for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time on June 6th when our topic will be mathematic literacy. We'll see you then.